So Jen, Tony, Will. All right, go ahead with uh, any questions you might have. Oh, microphone. The microphone. Yes. And we also can use this. this can use so, of course, dependent on you know what happens with these first EM missions, could you share your vision for where you think the future of these small sats or cube sats could go for planetary, moon, and beyond? What a great question. I didn't put a slide in there at that. Um, so, I think one of the greatest challenges for these planetary cube sats is. You know, as I said, shrinking all of that down into a little tiny package leaves you very little room for an instrument, um, and especially things, complicated kinds of things that we want to do. So to me, I'm not convinced that this class of satellites, the 6U class of satellites, is going to be the best thing to really address all of our science goals. But I can see a role for them definitely as secondaries, to a mothership. So if you can imagine, you know, flying near an asteroid, you could send one of these down to impact an asteroid or study its dust field. Um, and then it only has to communicate back to the, to the main ship. It doesn't have to communicate all the way back to the Earth. It doesn't have to propel itself all the way there. Um, going into the Europa radiation field would be a really great role for these. Um, doing little impacts or something like that, I think all of those are really great. And the other benefit that these have is by developing these tiny capabilities is uh, you can use these components now for your regular missions. You can use them for discovery missions or you can use them for some of these landed missions as, um, you know, if you need your instrument to operate for a really long time or to communicate on its own after the lander has died, maybe you could use CubeSat components to do some of those things. Yep, go ahead. Uh, over there, maybe? Yeah. yeah Let's grab the in, mic. Uh, Hold on one second. There, there have been um, several programs over the years where students are invited to look at images and report on whatever. I've been looking at the moon seriously for 50 years through my refractor. And I wonder, have, have those students contributed things of significance or that you have pursued further based on some observation that a, that a student uh, observed? Yeah, well, here, why don't you? Oh, well, I know, I know there's um, a creator counting, a community creator counting um, organization out there. I was looking for Stu Robbins because he worked with them. But it's, it's sort of a, what do they call it? Citizen science, citizen science, yeah. And, and it's for the moon, and it's looking at lunar images to try to identify um, a catalog of craters, and I know that's been really successful. But have you used anything to plan LRO observations? Not, I mean, where the where students have, have had input is into, for instance, targets for the camera. Yeah. There's a public website uh, on the LROC team's website where the, anyone can request targets, and I know that a number of students have placed target requests in there. It's an easy way for anyone uh, to, to make requests, whether you're a member of the science community or you're an interested student. I honestly think one of the benefits of, of, of having citizen science like that, especially for students, is just to get them aware that this is happening and the moon is interesting and, oh, my gosh, it's amazing. Um, I know Brian, Brian, yeah, you can answer that <laughs> eloquently more so than I. So one thing specifically with regards to uh, LROC images is I know that from a citizen stance, science standpoint, there have actually been uh, identifications made by citizen science of uh, S4B, Im at least one S4B impact site. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's interesting. And then, you know, aside from uh, what was going on, what's been going on with uh, LRO, and first, I need to congratulate you on the incredible volume of science and magnificent science that you were able to accomplish with all crosses lens cap, so that's really amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, also, uh, I point out that during the LATI mission, uh, there was a concerted effort by uh, amateur observers watching the moon and recording impact flashes actually during the uh, during the LATI mission. So, yeah, there, there's still plenty of room for 
uh, student and amateur participation. Of course. And um, it's, I'm glad you brought up the citizen science because it is something that NASA is taking seriously. And there's actually a group, a forum at NASA headquarters that meets monthly that talks about citizen science. And what I've learned is that uh, I think the astrophysics community is actually ahead of us in terms of citizen science because they have uh, multiple peer-reviewed papers that have come out based on data that's been analyzed by the public through these forums. And I feel like the planetary community, we're kind of just coming up on the curve and we're kind of just getting into this. So there's probably a lot of potential um, yeah. to move forward on that. One other thing, if you look at uh, what's coming out of the Planetary Society, a lot of the really useful, uh, scientifically useful image processing that's coming from Mars rover images is actually being done by citizen science so image processors, and that's something that you know we could conceivably leverage into the lunar community too. And that's a great point, like you see with Juno. I mean, they've really made it a focused effort to do that, and it's paying off in dividends. And I would say uh, we were about to uh, engage very heavily with the Lunar Crater Counting Group, citizen scientists, and they've developed some brand new tools um, because there's actually a dearth of crater counting in the polar regions. It's hard, uh, often because of the lighting and the illumination, but they had just tested it and they were ready to go. And so now it's a big part, I think, of future uh, planning processes going forward. It's, people are engaged and it's efficient. Track. Noah, have you looked at uh, the possibility of uh, putting together an LRO uh, uh, display that covers the Apollo 8 ground track? Yeah, okay, that's a good, yeah. So some it's 50th anniversary this is December. Hot on our heels. So some of you may remember a video that we put out several years ago now, uh, the aforementioned Ernie Wright um, recreated Earthrise. Took that little segment of time, what was happening on the spacecraft to do that. Around the same time, he was approached by a film company in the UK to recreate the ground track, basically what would have, what would they have been flying over. And he did the preliminary analysis behind that, uh, and at the time just didn't have the, uh, basically the storage capacity to put together several days, several orbits of, of, of data. I know he's worked a little bit on that, but we certainly now, and thanks to the work that he did, have a better understanding of where they were flying over. I mean, there were errors of several kilometers and the precise knowledge of where the spacecraft was, and he was able to, to reduce that to several meters. So um, that's certainly something that we are looking into doing and, and having ready for the 50th in, in December, um, as well as lots of other things rolling out over the next year, culminating on the 20th. But, but definitely, you know, as part of our understanding and our, the way LRO wants to engage with the 50th is, is telling the story not just of 11, but the lead up to what Apollo 11 did, which includes at least Apollo uh, 8 and 10 as well. Thanks, Jack. Did Ben have a question? No? Okay. Uh, this one's for Barbara. Um, I know that along with the benefits of having a very inexpensive mission come some real challenges for having a small budget. And one of those challenges that has been a concern for a while has been uh, the challenges faced by data management planning. And uh, what is the status of the data management plans for the upcoming EM1 CubeSats? So I know that we all want to archive in the PDS in some way. So there is a commitment from um, at least the three AES-funded missions and the SMD missions to archive data in the PDS. We'd like to have everyone else archive as they're able. The way they, they were selected, some of them had that in their budget and some of them didn't have it in their budget. And so there's some things to work out there. But I think at least on a best effort basis, we can get some of the data to be at least archived. We're still working out the details of how to do that. Everyone's going to publish. So at least it will come out you know, in a publication is sort of the minimum. Um, other than that, we're still working on it. Is that fair, Ben? Yeah. I 
yeah, I don't think that any, well, some of them will be full up normal PDS like you would get, mm -hmm. you know, for any spacecraft. Not all of them will be, I can tell you that. Um, but, you know, best effort for some of them. Uh, it occurred to me, and, and it may not be exactly the right f forum for this, but on Apollo 17, I sampled a permanently shadowed regolith, truly permanently shadowed, Station 6. Has anybody looked at that as a test case for samples that one might get in a permanently shadowed area? I know that the mercury concentration was higher than normal in that. That's the only analysis that I recall. Oh, it's, that's one of the samples in the new pristine sample consortium that's available. So they just put out a call for some of these samples that have never been looked at. That, that's, that one's in there? Mm hmm because uh, it stayed frozen. No, that's station two, I think. There was partially frozen, part of the sample was frozen. I'll have to check. I, yeah. I went through that list. There's and a I, there, oh, you went through the list? Okay, so well, you know I, I may I may have forgotten, but I didn't think the Station 6 sample was in there. So as, as far as I know, Jack, I mean, apart from some of the initial early sample, it hasn't been reevaluated in modern, the, the Station 6 PSR sample, and even the Apollo 16 one from House Rock. I mean, that'd be, a, well, not to give away, what, what's that? Shadow Rock, now I don't want to give away too many proposal ideas, but absolutely I think it would be worth giving a test just to see what's there. And I mean, I remember I've had conversations with Bill about what would it be. You know, those are as close as we have to permanently shadowed samples well, until we actually uh, go back. They were permanently shadowed. That's true, but uh, large-scale permanently <laughs> and, shadowed because they're not thermally... That's what I was going to say. Oh, yes. say it then. No, no, it's, it's one thing to be shadowed yeah. from sunlight, but you need to be also shadowed from all the IR incident around you. That will determine that stability temperature. So it's probably 200 uh, degrees. It's probably much warmer than anything like the 60 or 70 degrees. You expect no, to the polar regions where you have large areas far away from crater rims. Now, and it's just because the sun angles and then the, the hot surfaces that it, in its view factor. I don't think anyone's done that analysis though, but um, that it should be done to really understand what the temperatures would have been yeah, they, that you sampled from. The so Station 6 location was pretty well sheltered for by boulders. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure there was some scattered light that might have gotten in there, but not a lot. The station two, not so good. But, uh, One thing you wonder though, in those permanently shadow craters, you wonder if uh, grain rims that are, you know, we get the, uh, with, with Sarah Noble studies with the uh, electron microscopy, the top 100 nanometers, if the rim structures are a little different because the solar wind's not hitting them in the same way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That. Well, that it. I, I've forgotten the. Uh, I think the boulder probably roll. I've forgotten now. The, there's a, there isn't a, a an exposure age, on the station six boulder. Sixteen million, something like that. I know station seven was twenty something like twenty four million thing, uh, and that boulder track's just about gone, uh, but it's still there. Yeah. So. Anyway, something to think about, and I, and those anal the, the analysis, the only analysis I'm aware of was done 40 years ago at least, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we can do better now Absolutely. if the sample has been preserved properly. That's another important point. Yes. Okay. okay, folks, thank you again, and we have to put an end to this session. Thank you to everybody, the speakers, and the audience. <laughs>